I'm Sean Delaney, and you're listening to What Got You There. What Got You There is a must-follow for entrepreneurs, creatives, high achievers, and change makers. Each week, I sit down with some of the world's most influential people and focus on the journey behind their success. We uncover the strategy, tactics, and routines that help them get there. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Uh, what got you there? What got you? Got you? If you're enjoying the podcast, then you might want to check out some of the other things I'm working on behind the scenes. I put out a weekly newsletter called Momentum Monday, which is just a quick synthesis of everything I've been reading, listening to, and watching during the week. I also do a once a month deep dive called The Distillery, which is a long form distillation on someone whose thinking has greatly impacted me. You can check out past distillations of Josh Waitskin, Yen Liao, and Nick Konis, and everything else we're putting on at whatgotyouthere.com. Today on What Got You There, I sit down with photographer, author, and overall all-around creative person, David Ulrich. And the reason I wanted to have him on is I think he synthesizes down the stages of creativity better than anyone else. And when I say creativity, uh, I'm aligned with David that all of us are, are creative artists in our own life. And whatever we do is our creative act of expression, whether that's being uh, an actual photographer, whether that being a CEO, whether that being a mom, everything we do is our own act of creativity. And, and David and I discussed that. And, and what else we do is, is we describe the seven stages of creativity, what he synthesized and distilled down. And some of the other things that we talk about is uncovering what only each one of us can bring to the world, right? Like what are our unique gifts and, and how do we unleash them into the world? Another thing we talk about is going after the things we fear most in life. And, and that's a major struggle. Most of the things we want to go after we're too feel fearful of so david describes ways we can do this and then also uncovering what our unique gifts are that we can only bring to the world so this is a really deep and interesting conversation we're also going to touch on some concepts such as consciousness and uncovering uh the unconscious and how that influences the creative work so if, if you're into creativity unleashing your own gifts to the world i think you're really going to enjoy this conversation with david ulrich some people are born millionaires, others are self-made, but while no two millionaires or even billionaires follow the exact same path, they're all bullish on this secret asset class. Know what investment asset I'm talking about? It actually has nothing to do with stocks, cryptos, or even NFTs. According to the Wall Street Journal, market watchers are saying that the biggest payday for billionaires could come from the art market. I'd say skip the NFT mania. Why? Because that's not how billionaires are diversifying their portfolio and protecting their wealth for generations. They're investing in blue chip art. Why are they doing that? Because art outpaced the S&P 500 by threefold from 1995 to 2020 with nearly zero correlation to the public equities. But you don't need to be a billionaire to get in on this multi-trillion dollar asset class. Masterworks.io is the fintech platform democratizing the art market. In other words, you can start investing like the 1% and build a diversified portfolio of iconic contemporary works from Warhol to Picasso to Banksy. They've securitized over 90 paintings with the SEC and have over 280,000 users. In fact, hundreds of members just got a 32% annualized return from their Banksy sale. Demand has never been higher, but you can get immediate access with my special link. Head to masterworks.io slash what got you there to start investing. That's masterworks.io slash what got you there. You can also see more important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Are you looking for a delicious and healthy nutrition bar that is keto friendly, low sugar, and protein infused? If so, look no further than New School Snacks, who's reinventing the low sugar snacking revolution. Now, for me, health is one of the biggest things I think about, and eliminating the sugar from my diet is crucial, and that's why I love New School Snacks. So if you're one of those people who also want to change the way you approach nutrition and snacking, then head to NewSchoolSnacks.com for great deals on their collagen bar loaded with healthy fats from MCT oil, and while you're there, pick up one of their brand new mouth-watering French Toast Crunch Bars. That's NewSchoolSnacks.com. David, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Very good, and and thank you so much for having me, Sean. I, I enjoy and appreciate being here. No, no, I, I appreciate your work. Uh, I, I know I'm going to enjoy this conversation a lot. Uh, it's it's probably going to go down a few interesting rabbit holes, but but ones we're going to have a lot of fun with. And I want to start at a little bit of a different place. Um, 
th than most people might think we might be starting at. Um, it's not going to be around creativity. It's not going to be around cameras. I actually would love to start around the legendary basketball coach, Phil Jackson, who's infamous for coaching the Chicago Bulls during the Jordan era, and then also the Los Angeles Lakers during Kobe Bryant and the Shaquille O'Neal era. Uh, I would love to know what you've learned from Phil Jackson. Well, he also wrote a wonderful book. I think it's called Spiritual Lessons from a Hardwood Warrior or something like that. And I actually feature him in my writing because I think his Zen approach to the game is very powerful. So I'd like to read something to you. This is from a new book that of mine that's just been released. It's titled The Mindful Photographer, Awake in the World with a Camera. And it's a series of 55 short essays on photography and mindfulness. And one of the essays is titled Fitting Into the Flow of Time. At the end of the essay, I have five or six um, one-line lessons from Phil Jackson that I would like to read because I think these are very instructive for creative people. They certainly uh, have touched me. So without further ado, uh, the advice that Phil Jackson gives his uh his team members is number one, seek personal mastery. Number two, do not hold the ball for longer than two counts. Three, awareness is everything. Four, great possibility comes with great danger. Five, practice the art of acceptance. Six, embody compassion. Seven, have a love of the game, yet practice non-attachment. And finally, strive to understand the soul of teamwork. Hmm. Aren't those wonderful? <laughs> oh, those, those are fantastic. It's great. What, what I love about those is you mentioned he uses them with, with his teams, his basketball teams. But the, the, the underlying themes there are just so applicable to so many. Uh, so I just appreciate those. Is, is there one that that just really speaks to you that when you hear it, uh, just deeply identifies with yourself? Well, I think all of them speak to me. Um, I The two that I would put at the top are awareness is everything and seek personal mastery. I think the other ones flow from there. The other one that's interesting to me is great possibility comes with great danger. Because remember, Phil Jackson is dealing with team members with massive egos. And he's trying to corral these massive egos into a, um, a paradigm of teamwork and compassion. And I find that very related to seek personal mastery. Because seeking personal mastery isn't, of course, just about ourselves. I tell my students, you know, moments of intuition, moments of insight are not for ourselves alone. The, the, when we have a moment of insight or a moment of inspiration, it becomes a kind of responsibility to somehow transmit that out into the world. So, so I'm even thinking there in terms of your individual photography, even when you're taking an individual photo, you're beyond yourself there, right? Like you're thinking about how this photo is going to incite something in someone else. Am I, am I reading that correctly? Well, it's very interesting in the creative process because you are deeply connected to yourself. There's been many times where my intuition has said, you know, move over here or walk to this location. And suddenly there's a powerful image there. So I think that one's own inner connection is important. But ultimately, you're speaking to an audience. And, you know, one of the dangers of any art form is your ego. You're in the moment and you're thinking, oh, what a great picture this is going to be. Oh, people are going to love it. I'm going to get all kinds of likes. But that's not really where it's at. I think that a well-functioning artist, something is coming through them from a deeper level. In a way, we become a kind of a conduit. I don't like the word channel because channeling has too many weird connotations. But artists become a kind of conduit for something that needs to be brought into the world. 
I was reminded of, I haven't seen it yet, but this new three-part documentary on the Beatles. The Beatles were young boys. They were 20 years old, 21 years old. And something came through them that literally changed the course of the culture. And one would argue that they were simply a conduit for powerful energies and forces to be shaped through their work to influence the society and the culture at large. And I think that's what artists do. Our own very private experiences get universalized in a way that can speak to and touch and move others. I was talking to a few people before this call, just just trying to get some other insights um, around this. And a few of the people actually mentioned, they're like, well, this is really interesting, but I don't identify as a creative. I'm not an artist. And I'm just wondering what, what you have to say about that. Excuse my language, John, but hell, I don't buy that at all. Yeah. I'm right I mean, are you, you a, so you know. <laughs> are you a mother? Are you a father? Do you have a job? Do you have hobbies? I, I think that being an artist of life is an aim worthy of our humanity. Hmm. And anything we do can be approached creatively. I have observed parents that are very attentive and creative with their children. I've observed business people. Um, Steve Jobs, for example, uh, former head of Apple Computer, founder of Apple Computer. I think he approached his work as a creative task. So I don't buy it. I don't think that artists have a, have a corner on creativity. I think creativity is available to everyone. In fact, I would argue as human beings, I think it's one of the most distinctive things that makes us human. And I think the creative process is available to everyone. Yeah, I'm right there with you, David. Um, I view what we do, that that creativity comes out of us. And, and one of the phrases you use there that I love is artist of life. The, the longtime listeners know I'm a huge fan of Bruce Lee, and that's something he sought out. He he, he viewed himself as a, as a martial artist, philosopher, actor, but most of all, he viewed himself as an artist of life. And and I just love that framework going forward. I, I am intrigued, though. How, how do you define creativity? Well, I don't know if my attempt is going to mean anything because many, many more intelligent people than I have attempted to define creativity. <laughs> I think what's beautiful about creativity, there are certain aspects of it that you can define. Ultimately, I think it's a mystery. Ultimately, I think it's one of our, our greatest capabilities. I think we only stand on the threshold of it. So, uh, creativity, obviously, is bringing something into being. It is um, an act of transformation. We transform materials from one state to something more refined. For example, when you're making a pot, you start with clay, you start with earth. And through the process of shaping and glazing, you refine those materials, you transform those materials into something evocative and something meaningful. So I think creativity is innovation. It's bringing something into being. And above all, it's a process of transformation. But it's ultimately undefinable. It's a mystery. And that's what makes it so compelling and so beautiful. No, no, that's what I love. You mentioned bringing something into being. I, I, I'm wondering, is the expression, so let's take what you do, um, your, your photos, your photography, is your development and growth in your own photos, is that a parallel journey with your own personal development? Absolutely. You know, when I'm working with students, I want to see the work they do. It's one of the first things I want to do because the work they, they do is a reflection of who they are. Hmm. The work we do is a very deep reflection of who we are. And it often reveals things that are unknown to the artist. I can see things in people's work that perhaps at the moment they can't yet see themselves. So uh, I think it's an act of revealment. And it, if you agree with contemporary science that 85 to 95% of our mind is unconscious. Think about that. 
90% of our mind is unconscious. And what art and creativity can do is it can reach into the well of the unconscious. It can reveal some of the material that is there. And it is deeply self-revealing. But I would also argue that material in the unconscious is touched and affected by events and by culture. And some of what is present in our unconscious, what Jung calls the collective unconscious, is perhaps more related to the collective than it is me as an individual. Does that make sense? No, no, no. It makes absolute sense. I, I, I'm obsessed with, with the unconscious. Uh, I know there, there are certain studies around like our unconscious essentially is a processing every second around 11 million bits of information. That's that's through our, our, all of our senses. And right. we're, we're, con we're consciously aware of about 60 of them. So I'd almost say like the 90%, it's more like 99.999% that we're just completely <laughs> unaware of. And, and like that that's what I love. Like the, these unknowns, like I know there's something there to that around all of these things that I, I don't appear to be consciously aware of, but I'm picking up on them. It's it's funny you were even mentioning uh, a minute ago. You, you look at your students' art and instant or not instantaneously, but but pretty early on, it kind of reveals more about them, things that are unknown. Um, same thing for me in, in this podcast, my interviews. Uh, I've had people who are close to me to go. They, they came up to me and said, "Oh, I, I listened to a, a few of the past interviews." I know what problem you're working on right now. Like I, I know the struggle you're going through in your own life based on how your interviews are different from six months ago. And it's so true. Like these things that are unknown to us come through in our art form. And I would love to just know like what that's what that's like when when you start working with a new student. Like what are some of those other things that that you're observing and looking at just to help you get a deeper understanding? Well, a little bit of background. When I'm teaching a photography class, I can tell by the second or third class what images belong to what person. Hmm. People have a unique and distinctive way of seeing. Many people are not aware of that. I, I, I laugh with my students and say, how is it that we've come to adulthood with not understanding how we see? But it's true. Yeah. We, we don't know how we see. So it, the word authenticity is really important to me in teaching and in the arts. I believe that each person has a unique gift. One could call it their point of genius, even, where they have something very unique, very individual, very special that they can bring into the world. Most of the time, they don't know what it is. So the process of creativity is in part uncovering elements of the question, who am I? And what's remarkable about being an artist is being an artist both stimulates your growth and it reflects it back to you. So I can trace my own personal development through my images. I can see clearly my angst and inner conflicts when I was young. I can see clearly the maybe just the beginning of wisdom that I have as I get older. And I can see that process reflected in the images I make, even if the images also talk about things in the outer world. The beauty, of course, of photography is that it's both inward and outward looking. We're always dealing with an interaction with the world. And we are always dealing with an interaction with ourselves. Are you aware of that development in the moment? Like, can you look at a photo you just took and realize your own growth? Or does it take hindsight to be able to look back on those photos and realize that progression you were on? Well, Sean, it's a little bit of both. Because as we talked about, even perhaps 99% of our brain is unconscious. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yes, I can identify some elements in an image immediately, but unquestionably over time, more elements reveal themselves to me because many of them were driven by the unconscious and it takes time, exploration, and a process of revealment 
to learn more and more about their meaning. I have a picture on my wall. It's a photograph by Edward Weston. It's of a green pepper. It's called Pepper Number 30, 1930. I bought it as a print in New York City in 1971. And what is it now? It's 2021. And I can still look at it and receive more from it. It's remarkable. <laughs> it's like an inexhaustible well. And I think a powerful work of art is like that. It's an inexhaustible well that we learn more about over time. And for me, that's true of other people's artwork as well as my own. Hmm. I'm thinking about some of those inexhaustible wells. Is there a piece of art that has just had the greatest impact on you over your life? Well, there's many, um, maybe too many to, to list, but I can tell you of a couple of experiences. I would say about 10 years ago, I was in the Tate Gallery in London and I walked into the Rothko room, the Mark Rothko room. I've never been to the Rothko Chapel in Texas, but I walked into that room. There must have been eight or 10, you know, wall size Rothko paintings. And I was stunned into silence, hmm. stunned into a kind of state of presence. And I just sat there and looked at the paintings. It was a very similar experience to being in a Gothic cathedral. That's one experience. The other was in Honolulu. There's an, well, not in Honolulu. Uh, there was a museum called the Contemporary Museum. And there's a French artist named Christian Boltanski. And they were hosting an installation of his work. And I walked into this room. And the installation consisted of maybe 30 to 50 scanned photographs from a yearbook with lights around it as if each picture was a little shrine. And I looked at the work and I felt strangely moved. And then I read the wall description. These were scanned pictures from a yearbook of a graduating high school class in Vienna, Austria in 1938. And it was a Jewish school. I thought, oh my God, did these children survive the Holocaust? And I was moved to tears. The installation moved me to tears. I've never been moved to tears from a work of art before. I think that art can, one of the purposes of art is to expand our consciousness. Of course, I read about the Holocaust. Of course, I learned about it in school. But to be confronted with those 30 to 50 faces, young people, full of hope and possibility. And then the recognition is they probably did not survive the terror of the Holocaust. I, I, I would love to know when you say art should expand our consciousness. I, I just want to make sure I'm on the same page as, as you with that. What, what do you mean by that? Can I tell you a story? The, the title of, of your podcast is um, What Got You There, correct? Correct. When I was a young man, the Vietnam War was in progress. Many of my friends that I graduated from high school went to Vietnam. Some did not come back. Some came back all shot up and forever, forever altered. I was a photojournalism student at Kent State University in Ohio. And there was a protest against the Vietnam War in early May. President Nixon had just, just sent troops into Cambodia and the students were protesting that. And as a photojournalist, my, uh, my class and I were charged with photographing the event. The first two days of the event were what you would call a standard protest march. It was even festive with people's children and peace signs and marijuana wafting through the air. And then things started to get a little more crazy. On December 2nd, uh, May 2nd, the ROTC building on campus 
got torched, it got burned down, and radical groups descended onto the campus. May 3rd, the protest was getting more serious. There were many more students, and the governor called in the National Guard. There were National Guard troops everywhere. The morning of May 4th, 1970, very beautiful spring day, um, the National Guard retreated to a hillside. They raised their rifles and they fired directly into the crowd of college students. Think about that. 30 National Guardsmen fired armor-piercing bullets directly into a crowd of college students who were standing half a football field away from the guardsmen. These were the shootings at Kent State. Four students were killed, seven or eight students were wounded, and I was absolutely shocked. I did not see the killing. It was a very large demonstration and I was in a different part of the campus. But when I recognized what happened, I was stunned, I was shocked. How could young men from the same cities and towns of the college students turn around and fire their rifle into the crowd unprovoked. Now, you know that no captain in the National Guard is going to have the order to, going to give the order or have the authority to order the guardsmen to fire at college students. That order had to come from very high up. People believe it was the governor or perhaps even President Nixon. In any case, in that moment, I recognized the absolute ineffectiveness of violence. I was very young, so this was not a thought. This was more an intuition. I felt two things in that moment. I felt that, that first, violence could never be an effective way of solving problems that what was needed was an expansion of consciousness. We needed to see more. We needed to be more present, be more com compassionate, and that a revolution of consciousness was the only thing that could change the world. And the second intuition I had in that moment is that art and creativity can help in that process. So from that moment on, I put photojournalism aside and I committed to becoming an artist. So that really is one of the stories that, that made me realize that what we need as a people to solve our problems is an expansion of consciousness, a revolution, if you will, of consciousness. I'm wondering, after a moment like that, um, we can call that just even in an inflection point for your life. Like, what does that look like moving forward? I, I understand you realize that art is going to be your thing moving forward there. But, like, what else changes about you from before that? Of to course, <clears throat> I was 20 years old. I had never had contact with violence or death before Vietnam and before Kent State. So it was horrible. I was um, in a state of anger and depression. I found it hard to function. My girlfriend broke up with me because I was so depressed. It took months for me to integrate that event. And in the integration of that event, my life changed. I suddenly dropped out of school you know, I, I spent a year um, with a menial job delivering flowers and uh, finding teachers and finding photography teachers that could help me on the path of becoming an artist. I met two teachers that were very, very important to me. One was a man named Nicholas Labetsi in Cleveland, and his teacher was a man named Minor White. Minor White was a well known photographer, one of the most influential in the medium in the mid 20th century. His whole thing was learning to see, 
a camera is an instrument that helps you learn to see without a camera, basically. And I spent six years as a student of Minor White. So what Kent State did is it changed the trajectory of my life. After the initial trauma, it brought me in touch with teachers and it brought me in touch with a a new trajectory, if you will. Yeah, David, I think that's really helpful that you even mentioned, let's just call it some of the stumbling that you needed to go through um, in, in your own process, in your own growth. I am wondering, you mentioned some of the teachers. How vital is a teacher on someone's own self-progression? Like, can people achieve a level of self-mastery without a teacher? Or is that a necessary component of it? It's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to it. But I do feel that having a teacher is a seminal experience. You need to have a guide navigating the inner world, navigating the world of creativity is subtle. And I find, for me, it would have been impossible to do without guidance without a mentor, without a teacher. And I received so much from my teachers. And I can't imagine doing it alone. I'm I, I'm sure that if you were in a remote location, you didn't have access to a teacher, growth would be possible. But I think that more growth is possible with a teacher. Hmm. I'm thinking about that growth, and, and David, you, you know I'm a fan of Joseph Campbell, and one of my favorite lines of all time of his is, the cave we fear to enter holds the treasure that we seek. And I'm wondering for you, like I would even love for you just to expand on that, like how you view that, how you think about g- going after the thing that we fear most. Well, what is it that we fear most? Usually what we fear most is lodged in our unconscious it's usually a part of ourselves. Now I'm saying that living in a civilized society, there are people that live in war torn regions of the world where they fear getting up in the morning because they might not go to bed that night. But I'm, I'm speaking specifically to people in the civilized world. We do not have external threats. We have internal threats. Many of the complexes, many of the um, fears that we hold are lodged in the unconscious. They need to be uncovered and they need to be seen. First of all, we need to see them. How do you even become aware of what needs to come out? Right? Like, I feel like you're someone who's very attuned, right? Like, we even mentioned awareness and and just understanding those things deep within you. How do those people who are first even getting introduced to this type of conversation, what should be going through their head? I would say that when you're young and you're beginning to explore the inner world, your angels and your demons both have equal force. Mm -hmm. So as a young photographer, when I would go out in the world and make photographs, certain things would excite me greatly. I felt a sense of resonance as if what I was photographing was a part of me. But what was weird at the time, I didn't and I couldn't make any distinction between my angels and my demons. The reflection of both were powerful and compelling. But once these things are externalized, for me, it was with photography. One of the ways that people can externalize their unconscious is through artwork, through photography, or through journaling. You know, sitting down and just writing whatever comes into your mind. You need to find a way to externalize what is within. And over time, you can begin to untangle the relationship between our angels and our demons. Over time, you can begin to see what is within. Seeing is the first step. I don't want to say self-change. I don't want to say self 
transformation, I want to say seeing, simply becoming aware. If I see that I'm angry or depressed or or something, does that have a source? Can we find a way to externalize that? I think journaling is a really, really good tool for a lot of people that are not artists. Sitting down and doing free writing, writing whatever comes to mind. We need to find a way to unlock what Natalie Goldberg calls the wild mind. And artwork can do that, drawing, painting, photography, but so can journaling, so can writing. The danger is when we project those negative elements in our unconscious onto other people. Look what's happening today. Look at the anima of race. How many people are deeply prejudiced, deeply intolerant, deeply, um, I don't know what the word is, deeply offended by people of other races. That's crazy. But that's because they are projecting their own fears, their own demons onto other people. And that's when it becomes dangerous. If we don't have an outlet, then we tend to project our fears and our demons on our friends, our associates, or even the world at large. That's why I think conversations like this are so helpful um, because I I hope that more people start exploring that, becoming aware and actually seeing uh, to to hopefully uh, avoid some of this violence that we're seeing. One of, one of the things that, that you do bring up there was journaling. That's something that I, I found a lot of success in. Um, what I would do early in the morning is I know this has been called morning pages where literally the like first right. thing just for 15 minutes, just nonstop, my hand does not stop moving. And you kind of can all of a sudden start to uncover some of those things that are deep down. So for anyone who who's looking to explore a bit further, that that is something you might want to try. D- David, something you've done so well Um and this, I, I appreciate the heck out of it, is how you've uncovered and really distilled down the creative process. And we're going to get more into even like the seven stages of creativity that you've tapped into. But I would just love to know, like, what was that process is actually uncovering your creative process like? I'm going to lean down and pick something up here. Yeah. In when I was, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, I read a book. Oh, you can't see it. It's backwards. It's called The Creative Process, Reflections on Invention in the Arts and Sciences. It's a series of 75 essays by artists, scientists, mathematicians, writers, you know, people like D.H. Lawrence, Albert Einstein, Vincent van Gogh, Gertrude Stein, Henry Miller, William Butler Yeats, etc. And I read this book of essays 75 essays on creativity. And I realized, oh my God, they're all saying the same thing. Hmm. They're all saying that there are identifiable stages of the creative process. And I was, you know, 20 years old. So I said, huh, that's interesting. Hmm. I I couldn't do anything with it yet. I was too young. But over time, I began to observe these stages in my own work. I began to see them in the work of my students, in the work of my teachers, in the work of my peers. And I began to realize that creativity was not an act, it was an event that unfolded over time with identifiable stages. Now, we have to be very careful here because The formulaic mind, the part of my mind that can identify these stages is still just the threshold of an understanding. We have to, I had to walk a very fine line between maintaining the mystery of the process and trying to define it. There's a vital tension point there. We need to try to understand things. But at the same time, we cannot take something very large and truncate it down 
and make it small enough for our rational mind to understand. So our rational mind has to understand, but yet we also have to recognize the mystery. So that's the fine point, the fine line that I feel I walk in talking about and writing about creativity. Can you actually go even a little bit further there between left brain and right brain, you know, like logic and then really stretching out? Because I feel like you really do do such a good job in, in that, that center section, that tension point. And I would, I would love just to hear you expand upon it. Well, I really try. You know, when I'm writing, um, I depend upon what I'm going to call inspiration or the muses. Oftentimes I sit down and write. And, you know, it's okay. Maybe it's even good, but it's flat. I'm just kind of writing out of my own mind. Maybe after an hour or so, something begins to click. It becomes more fluid, more juicy. And suddenly, I feel like I'm in touch with a deeper part of my mind. And suddenly, I feel like the words are coming through me. I make an analogy to athletics. I'm a swimmer. I was a competitive swimmer in my youth, and I still swim about three quarters of a mile every day. When I get in the water in the morning, it's cold. My muscles are stiff. I don't want to be there. But I, my discipline gets me there, and I get in the water, and I, I start to swim. And after about eight or ten laps, something changes. The hormone, the endorphins get released. And suddenly it becomes more fluid and alive. It's the same with the creative process. When it's coming from me, when I first sit down to write or go take pictures, it's flat. I don't want to be there. And then over time, if I stay with it, we enter the flow. The endorphins get released. It becomes more fluid. And suddenly... Through inner quiet, I have access to what I'm calling the deeper parts of my own mind. However, we have to raise the question, what is inspiration? There are different beliefs on what inspiration is. Psychologists believe inspiration comes from the unconscious, from the deeper parts of the mind. Religious people or spiritual seekers believe that inspiration comes from higher energies that surround us. Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, indigenous people believe that inspiration comes from the voices of our ancestors. And highly social people believe that inspiration comes from the energies that pass between us as human beings. I actually believe that some measure of all of the above are true. I don't think it's just my unconscious or your unconscious. I think we can tap into something deeper. Again, it's the mystery of something, energies that surround us at every moment, but most of the time we're not attentive to them. Does that make sense? No, no, no. It does make sense. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, all of this, like, th- there's not black and white. And it, it's funny, like, in a society that we're always grasping for that black and white. And so I guess, like, one of the things I, I see a lot is is just some of the, the other things I do. I'm, in, I'm involved with a lot of logical people, right? Like, investors, high-end business people. And they have a tough time it, it getting out of their own logic. And so I, I – you must have worked with plenty of people. And I'm just wondering, like, what advice do you have for them? that can kind of just like peel back slightly on that and maybe just become more aware of some of these other things. I found a phrase last night when I was teaching that I said to my students, the phrase just kind of came about. And the question is, when can you give an unambiguous yes? Do you know how the iPhone was was created? What's interesting about the iPhone is Steve Jobs said, oh, we want to create a phone. And people said, well, why? And Steve Jobs said, well, we want a phone that can, you know, access the internet and be a telephone and, you know, send 
instant messages. And people said, well, we already had that. It's called a BlackBerry. And Steve Jobs said, no, that's not elegant. We need an elegant solution. So he put together a team to develop the iPhone. And they struggled for the better part of a year trying to figure out how an Apple product could be better than a BlackBerry. Because a BlackBerry did everything Steve Jobs wanted it to do. And one of the members of the team had an idea, an inspiration that grew out of their brainstorming. And that inspiration was a software keyboard, a software keyboard. And bam, that was an unambiguous yes. That moment of inspiration created these little shamanistic devices that we carry around. A software keyboard, simple, but yet it took them many months to get to that insight. I, I love the incubation period on so much of this. And I, well, I, I realize now that we actually didn't even uncover your seven stages of creativity. So I think this would be helpful if you, if you could just map out those seven stages, then we can dive into some of these further. And, well, the first stage of creativity is obvious. What is the medium? What is the theme? What is it that, that I need to speak about that you need to speak about? So the first stage I'm calling discovery and encounter. We discover a medium and a theme that is suitable to our body type, that is suitable and amenable to who we are. And then we begin. We bring a process of attention and concentration to the task. That's stage one. Stage two is great fun. I call it passion and commitment. It's where we really get passionate about the subject. Obsession is considered a negative thing in life. I would consider an obsession a positive thing with artists. We become obsessed with our theme. We become passionate about it. It becomes very powerful, very juicy. And many discoveries are made in the moment. Many discoveries are made serendip in a serendipitous way at this stage. And we also make a commitment to seeing it through. Stage three is the stage we all know so well. It's called crisis and creative frustration. We hit the wall. We can't go any further on our conscious initiative. Our initial impulse has been expended, has been spent. And suddenly we're faced with obstacle. What do we do? How do we approach that obstacle? There's three ways to approach it. The first is the macho approach. I'm going to try to blast my way through it. Does that work? No. The second is the passive or the poor me approach. I'm going to wait for somebody to come rescue me. Does that work? No. The third option is to seek a new perspective. So that brings us to the fourth phase, retreat and withdrawal. We step back from the work. We allow it to gestate in the unconscious. Have you ever been in an argument with another person? You know, you're like this. And suddenly one person steps back and you come to a new perspective and you can come back and have some dialogue. So retreat and withdrawal. We step back from the work. We put our initiative on hold. We do research, we do exploration, we allow the idea to gestate in the unconscious. Stage five, epiphany and insight. Do you know how Einstein discovered the theory of relativity? The, uh, he was yeah. struggling with this question for a long time, working hard with conscious endeavor to understand the relationship between space and time. One day he got very frustrated. He said, screw it. I can't do this anymore. And he went to bed that night. And before he went to sleep, the E equals MC squared just appeared in his mind as an image. 
it just came to him. Epiphany and insight. After we retreat from the work, after we allow the unconscious to gestate and incubate, something can come to us. Inspiration. The Greeks called it the muses. I call it epiphany and insight. Often the guiding vision of the work we need to do. Then stage six is called discipline and completion. Once we have the guiding vision, we need to develop our craft and do the work. And that takes a certain amount of self-discipline. I know many artists who are very gifted with insight, but don't have the wherewithal to finish something. Finishing something is not easy. It's often difficult. And then stage seven, responsibility and release. Our children need to be released into the world. We need to get our project out the door. Number one, to communicate with others. And number two, to clear the slate for future projects. Otherwise, we have massive indigestion and constipation. <laughs> we need to get it out the door in order to clear the way for the new. <laughs> One of those stages I would love to hit on is the retreat and withdrawal period. And I, I'm wondering, obviously, all of these things are extremely nuanced or, or they can be. And so I'm wondering how long that period can last. And then what does it look like during that? Are you fully disengaging from whatever project you're currently working on? Or are you are you doing things that kind of touch on the project, but just not fully immersing yourself? It's a good. It's a very good question. You know, in the case of Einstein, that retreat and withdrawal phase was overnight. Yeah. However, for many of us ordinary mortals, that retreat and withdrawal phase lasts much longer. For me, it's often, you know, months, if not years. What I like to say in the retreat and withdrawal phase is anything, any word that begins with R-E is what we should be doing. Retreat, research, revision, renewal, revisit. So it's a time of revisiting. It's a time of revising. It's a time of rethinking. It's a time of research. So no, we're not idle during that period. Um, often when I write a book, for example, the retreat and withdrawal phase is when I go in and start doing revision and editing. So I don't think it's an idle phase, but I do think we need to leave a certain amount of time available just to be, Natalie Goldberg, the writer says, just lie on the couch. It's a good place to begin. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering for you, I'm just intrigued now, what is your actual writing process like? Usually when I write a book, well, how do I say this without sounding weird and new agey? Most of the books I've written have been inspired in the sense that I wake up one morning and suddenly there's a book title and the chapters just appear in my mind. So when I first wrote my book on creativity, I was exhausted. It took me a, a fall to write the book. And by the holidays, I was exhausted. And I wanted some time off. And I was driving to the post office in early January. And suddenly, out of the blue, a new book appeared in my mind, just appeared out of nowhere. And the chapter headings came along with the title, and I don't know what kind of language I can use here, but I'm going to use yeah, you can say um, whatever. obscene language. My first thought was, oh, wow. My second thought was, oh, shit, now I've got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, in between this, oh, wow, and oh, shit. <laughs> So I, I'm actually like really intrigued now. So you have these ideas, these concepts in your head. Are you just like unleashing your writing um, like hours each day? Like what does that actually look like when it, when it comes to fruition? Well, but, but you know, don't forget 
the things I write about have been gestating in my mind for decades. I first read that book on the creative process when I was 20 years old. By the time I was 24 years old, I knew someday I wanted to write a book on creativity. So when I was 24, I thought someday I'd write a book on creativity. I didn't start writing that book for 20 years till I was in my mid 40s. So it took 20 years of, of gestation for this moment of insight to appear. So when I sit down to write, it's an urgent process, largely because the material has been gestating in my mind for decades. And when I sit down to write, it's time. It's ready. The material is at the forefront of my consciousness and it just comes pouring out. Hmm. I write very quickly. I write the first draft of a book usually in two or three months. And then, of course, it takes a much longer time to go back and edit and revise. Hmm. So, so now I'm thinking about this because I feel like this somewhat ties in. Uh, I know you've studied a lot of Taoism, and, and one of the concepts I love is, is the Uwe, in essentially like trying not to try, right? And, and so I'm wondering how we need to think about active at- intent and surrendering, right? Like surrendering to the scenario. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on this because I feel like so often today, all we try to do is is force, 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 right? Like go harder, push harder. And I've discovered that so many of these amazing breakthroughs happen when we surrender to the scenario. And I'm just wondering your thoughts and what you've uncovered in all your time studying this and then also living this. It's a question of being sensitive to the process. We cannot always be doing. We need to be sensitive about when we need to step back. So, for example, think about a river. A river is flowing along and it hits big boulders or rocks. And slowly, the river fills up. We're living, we're living, we're living. The river fills up and it goes over the boulders. So for me, that's what creativity is like. Hmm. When the material is ripe, it comes out. You know, when the river comes up and spills over, it's time to come out. However, if I try to manifest something too early, it's not ripe. Have you ever tried to eat an unripe piece of fruit? That's what it's like. Hmm. So when it's ripe, it will naturally emerge, but we need to have a sensitivity. We cannot always be pushing forward. We need to understand when the time is right to push forward. Within that process um, of knowing the right time, I feel like there's there's a lot of times there's that that tension between the confidence, right, the self belief that you know what I, I can push forward with this, but then also discovering how little you know. And I'm just wondering in your own creative and artistic journey, what that process has been like, both in understanding your own confidence and how that even gives you the belief to go on to try and attempt further things, versus being able to discover new things. Well, you touched on something important. Inner confidence is a really important trait to cultivate. I think what holds a lot of people back is fear of inadequacy. For whatever reason, self-esteem has become an enormously difficult issue in our culture. So we need to have a sense of inner confidence that, that there's something in me that I can give to the world. But For me, my biggest obstacle is impatience. Hmm. It's an obstacle that I face on a daily basis. I want to bring things to completion, but they're not ready. So I am constantly in every mode in my life needing to find that balance between action and retreat, between assertion and surrender. Hmm. And I've learned that patience is a trait that needs to be cultivated because very often 
the most meaningful things we do take place over time. And I had an argument with my students the other day. We were arguing about whether or not they should be allowed to use cell phones in the classroom. And they said, oh, we can multitask. And I said, well, isn't a patience a virtue you want to cultivate? They said, no, in today's world, we don't need patience. Everything is immediately available. There's a real danger in that attitude. Absolutely. I believe that the quality of our attention is one of the most important gifts we can give to ourselves and to the world. And in that attention, there are dynamics that become visible. Yes, I need to move quickly now. No, I need to stand back now. So Phil Jackson said it well, awareness is everything. Don't hold the ball for longer than two seconds. When do I need to hold it? And when do I need to pass it to a teammate? It's funny, right? Because one of the things I have such an issue with is looking for these black and white answers. But at the same time, here I am, I'm sitting over here and I'm, it's like, I almost want that, that black and white answer because I view this as, it's like two hands holding a rubber band, right? Like the, the tension of who we currently are and then, and then where we're trying to get to. It's this constant tension I'm always feeling. And so I'm wondering for you, how do you, how do you understand internally when it's time to put the foot on the gas and go harder and you're not actually doing the work that's required versus, you know what, this is actually, I, I've pushed too far. Um, just be, because I know my, my own personalities, I tend to try to push, 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 push. So like I, I need to get more insight into pulling back. And I, I'm just wondering how you, how you think about that. You know, Sean, it's, it's a huge problem for me. Uh, my impatience is a huge obstacle. It's, it's probably the thing I need to resist daily. But let's look at that. What takes place when we can resist our obstacles? If I can resist my impatience, it can help me be more sensitive to the moment. Like what is needed in this moment? I can often see what is needed in the moment, but my impatience will push forward anyway. So for me, what's required is resistance. I need to resist my obstacle. I need to resist the obstacle of my impatience. Hmm. And in doing so, I can come more cleanly into the attentive part of me that can see what is required in the moment. Hmm. But I, I'm, I don't want to talk about this as something I've mastered. This is not easy. It's a constant struggle for me, as I think it is for many people today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, th- this journey, this never ends, right? Like even even when you when you achieve the highest levels, I'm trying to remember, it's, it's one of the legendary um, Japanese directors and he re- receives a Lifetime Achievement Award. This is like the 1992 Oscars. Um, and he receives this Lifetime Achievement Award. And he basically gets up there to accept the award. And he says, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not deserving of this. I'm such a beginner still. And it's like, here's this guy who's been doing his craft for 60 plus years and has literally received the Oscar for a Lifetime Achievement Award. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm just still a beginner, right? <laughs> like, and it's just like, right. that is beautiful. It's like, wow. Like, I, I just wish so many more of us could, could not only have that at a younger age, but have that into his age as well. I thought that was beautiful. I was listening to a Buddhist teacher uh, talk to a group of students. And one of the students said, when I sit and meditate, my mind is clear. I am at peace. It's such a beautiful experience. Another student said, when I sit to meditate, my mind is so noisy. I am constantly having to try to observe my noisy mind. I'm constantly needing to distance myself from the noisy mind. My body is wanting to move. I see twitches. I feel impatience. I want to get up from the cushion and move onward. And the teacher said, that's meditation. (laughs) That's the most important kind of meditation where we struggle against our tendencies. When I say against our tendencies, I don't mean against our real tendencies. I mean, we struggle against our tendencies 
the noisy mind, the impatient body. We need to resist these things. There needs to be an act of resistance. And in that struggle, in that struggle, moments of insight and moments of peace arise. Is life struggle for you? Say that again? Is life struggle? Well, life is many things, and that's one of them. Yeah. Life is struggle. Life is pain. Life is joy. Life is insight. Life is frustration. For me, it's all of those things. That- I, I, am not, I am not an evolved master. But, but but you have a lot of wisdom. You have a lot of insight. I, I think this is, this is a, gr- a great place to bring up um, the losing of your right eye. And I, I would love to read a quote because I think this is extremely insightful. Uh, and then I hope we can explore this. And the quote is from you. And it's fear, fearing the loss of my capacity to see and photograph. And with all hope to the contrary, this blow helped to awaken my own awareness. Losing an eye and facing the resulting need to learn to see again, this time as an adult, assisted the growth and development of my perceptual capacities and helped me better understand the function and process of sight. Above all, I learned to not take vision for granted. It was a profound learning experience, one that continues to this day. The experience was traumatic and painful, like nothing else I have ever experienced, and a great privilege. I I have to assume a lot of people hear that quote and – can't even fathom first of all the fact of of losing an eye but then to be able to then say it's a great privilege um so I, i'd be honored if you just unpack that for us i think this could provide some real insight for everyone you know going back to the title of your show what got you there there was a moment there was an inflection point there was a moment of change i lost my eye when i was chopping wood i was dropping logs onto a pile and a stick flew up and went right up under my eye. And my first two thoughts were, oh shit, I won't be able to swim today. And my second thought was, oh damn, I'm going to have to have stitches on my face. That's all I thought. Hmm. My girlfriend drove me to the emergency room and the emergency room doctor said, quote unquote, oh my God, we have to call an eye doctor immediately. (laughs) <laughs> that's when I started to freak yeah. out. <laughs> the eye doctor came and said, you must calm down. Your tension is causing a loss of vitreous fluid. I thought, oh my God. I said, doctor, you've got to save my eye. I'm a photographer. He said, you'll be as good a photographer with one eye as you were with two. I went into surgery for eight hours They tried to repair my massively damaged retina. They had to rebuild the side of my face with cosmetic surgery because I lost a lot of tissue. And then I spent a week having tests done to determine if any useful vision could be returned to the eye. And the answer was no. That was the darkest moment of my life. And they said it should be removed. So 10 days after the accident, my mother and my girlfriend drove me to the hospital and I checked in and I said, hi, I'm David Ulrich. I'm here to have my eye removed. It was the most surreal thing. And I went into the hospital room. This was about 10 a.m. and the surgery was at noon. And the nurse said, do you want a Valium? I said, no, I I need to experience this moment as fully as possible. And my mother and girlfriend were very freaked out and were being very solicitous. So I needed to take a walk. I took a walk to the hospital chapel and I sat down and I just felt despondent, like my life was over. And then I had a moment of realization, a moment of insight If I can't let go of something as small as a small part of my body, how will I let go of my entire body when I die? That moment changed everything. From that moment on, losing an eye became a creative journey. And I really believe what I experienced is true. I was given the opportunity 
to learn to see again as an adult. And as a photographer, that's an enormous gift. Uh, I'm wondering after the surgery and after that insight, what was the most challenging element moving forward? Well, of course, depth, depth perception was a challenging element. Um, I would, I would reach over to pour something into a glass and I would pour it on the table. <laughs> and, and not knowing what I could do. I'll not knowing. That. Well, I didn't know. Could I drive again? Could I live a normal life? Would I look disfigured? I didn't know the answer to any of these things. So I was in the hospital after they removed the eye. The very next day, I was the um, department chair of an art department at that time. And the very next day after my surgery was student orientation of the students in my department. And I woke up after the surgery and I thought, oh my God, I need to go to work. I cannot just sit in this hospital room. I'm going to get horribly depressed. So I said to my mom and my girlfriend, I said, I'm going to drive into Boston and go to work. And they said, oh, David, you can't do that. You're crazy. But I needed to see, I needed to challenge myself. I needed to see if I could drive again. So I got in the car. My girlfriend came with me just in case. And I drove 20 miles to Boston. I walked into the room. You know, half my face was bandaged. You know, like tails from the crypt, basically. <laughs> but I needed to experiment right away with what I could do and what I couldn't do. And driving... I realized is something I could still do. Hmm. And it turns out there's very few things I can't do. I'll never be a great tennis star because I don't have the subtlety of depth perception, but there's nothing I did before that I can't do now. After that experience, how do you, how do you feel all this relates to your own personal mastery? Well, losing an eye became a journey of integration. I really needed to face my mortality. And I think that recognition that someday I'm going to have to let go of my body became a gift and became a powerful transforming force. I am not my body. And what losing an eye served to do, you know, the you've heard the story of the Zen master who comes up and whacks the student with a stick on the side of the head, and suddenly their ego is broken free. That's what happened to me. I felt like my injury broke through a certain amount of egotism, a certain amount of pettiness. Things that I cared about before losing an eye were things I didn't care about post-injury. So it did help to eviscerate my ego. It gave me more compassion. It gave me more awareness. And it really did become an engine, if you will, of personal integration. <laughs> Do you view that this for you was your hero's journey to, to talk about Joseph Campbell? Oh God, yes. So it was it was the Zen master stick. Yeah. It was Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Yes, absolutely. So is is that going to, to the depths of despair there? Is that a necessary evil in order to get to your higher self? Do you have to go through hell to get there? I don't know. I don't know if you need to go through hell, but I do know you need to confront your personal demons. Hmm. And for some people, that may be more difficult than others. For me, for whatever reason, I needed a massive injury to let go of my ego. 
other people seem to be able to manage that with less stress. But there needs to be a process of purification. Hmm. There needs to be a process of seeing and accepting what is within me, both my angels and my demons. Hmm. M- mentioning what you felt that, that you needed in order to get to that place and thinking about back to earlier in our conversation, you were mentioning authenticity. And I'm just wondering your take on authenticity and, and what's holding the majority of people back from allowing their authentic self to come through. I think today it's two things. I think it's cultural conditions. We are taught we need to be a certain way. Most people aren't that way. And for a lot of young people, it causes a real lack of self-esteem, a lack of inner confidence. I think secondly, our culture does not have the attitude that everybody has an equal gift. We still function on the quote unquote great man model. There are certain people that are geniuses and the rest of us are ordinary mortals. I think we need to have the confidence that there's something in us that demands to be expressed in the world. Hawaiian culture has a beautiful word It's called kuleana. In Western thinking, our privilege and our duty, our honor and our responsibility are diametrically opposed. What we love and what we do are often at odds with each other. The word kuleana in Hawaiian culture means my privilege, my honor, my duty, my responsibility all rolled into one. And I think each person on this earth has their kuleana, a place of genius. Romans called it the genus. A place where we can both give and receive to and from life in a way that is distinctly our own. But we need to get beyond the cultural conditioning that says, oh, we need to be this way or that way We need to look like this. We need to act like this. It's a horrible obstacle, especially for young people. Have you found anything? I know you work with a a lot of younger students that has allowed them to break free from some of those culture constraints. You have to inculcate in students that they have a voice, they have a vision, They have something to offer. And even if they don't know yet what it is, they have the freedom to explore it. Mm -hmm. Most people don't feel that freedom. They feel perhaps because of societal constraints, perhaps because of what is considered in on Instagram and social media, they don't feel that what their gift is, is valuable. And I don't know how to instill that inner confidence, but I do know how to give them the freedom and the the safe space, if you will, to explore their vision or their voice. Hmm. I'm even wondering about people understanding what their creative medium even is. How, how do people unleash that? I feel like so many people are, are bouncing around. They, they don't have a clue in terms of what that is. The key word is resonance. What do you resonate with? Yeah. You know, what What are you attracted to from deep within? And don't be afraid to follow that. There's a young Hawaiian artist that I know who's making weapons making weapons. One of the native Hawaiian arts of ancient times was weapon making. And at first she said, oh, I can't do that. Who would accept a weapon as a work of art in today's world? Look at all the gun violence. But yet it was hers to do. 
So we have to be willing to just say yes, hmm. to, to seek what we resonate with from deep within and to follow it and to have a certain amount of faith in regard to where that might lead. And, and we have to be willing to explore. Remember that the key for success is failure. We have to experiment and explore a number of things that don't work out before we explore that which does work out. Hmm. No, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think that's, that's just a beautiful insight that I think certain people are starting to come around to. I just wish more would. Uh, I'm wondering, though, one of the things I appreciate when, when reading your books is the number of amazing quotes you've pulled from and interesting insights and resources. I mean, it's it's a vast amount of knowledge that, that you have and, and you, you pinpoint in your writing. I'm thinking for you, though, like which thinkers have just like greatly impacted you over the years? And they, they could be across different domains. I'm, I'm just wondering who, when you look back, you're like, you know what? These people foundationally changed how I looked at things. I'm going to answer that question. But first, I want to tell you a story. When I was in second grade, I loved quotations. I loved them. <laughs> I would seek them out. And the, um, the local newspaper, the Akron Beacon Journal, Akron, Ohio, actually published 10 of my favorite quotes in the newspaper. Hmm. So I'm telling that story because I think as children, if we look back to our childhood, we can find those things that genuinely interest us. I love words. I love quotes. And yes, I'm, I'm a master at uncovering the right quote. But when I look back to my childhood, that was there from a very, very early age. So what is it in you that just doesn't go away? That's part of discovering who you are. In terms of thinkers and people, 